Hey, everyone. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Matty Taos, and I get to be one of the pastors here at Epiphany Station. And we're about to dive into our third conversation from the Theology of Love teaching series. But before we do, uh, there's something really big that I want to let you know about that's going on in the life of Epiphany Station. And over the last couple of months, we've been kind of pouring ourselves into this big project to get started and get kicked off and actually get to come to completion before Easter. And that is the creation of our children and family ministry space that we're creating from scratch upstairs. And over the last couple of weeks, some changes started to happen, like it started to look like a legit space. We started slapping paint on the walls. Well, other people were doing it properly. I was slapping paint on the walls. And we started to actually give it some color and vibrancy because we, this, as you can tell, is going to be the space where we want to be able to embrace dozens, hundreds of children so they can know the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we got this work started and a lot of things are moving. This week, linoleum and carpets coming in. We've got the heating and cooling, the electrical systems done. And we're getting to that point where our goal to have all of this done before Easter is actually going to be a reality. And so I don't mind standing here letting you know what it's going to take to get us from where we are now to that finish line. There are a few things that we still need and we have a a number and a figure of what we need financially to get it completely finished and done. That number is $36,000 to get it to the place where our children's ministry people want it to be so it is safe and it is ready for us to embrace many more people than before. We're doing all of this because we found that this year, God is calling us to embrace these young families like we've never been able to in the past. So if this is something that you feel a personal draw towards or God when he prompts you to be a part of Epiphany and know what we're doing, this is the next big thing for us. And so if you want to support it financially, you can. We don't want anything to be guilt-driven, but if you feel prompted to do so, you can give at Epiphany Station in three ways. We have red boxes spread throughout the facility. We have a tablet in the back corner of the worship space here that's connected to our secure online giving. But maybe you're watching at home online right now or later this week, and you can actually go to epiphanystation.com under the Give tab, set up one time or recurring giving there. We're doing all of this because God has called us to be a generous church. And generosity looks like not always putting money into things that serve you back, but putting them into something that is going to serve where God is building the kingdom next. And we see that with our young families and our children. Now, like I said, uh, this is the third week in a series of conversations we're having called the Theology of Love. Now, theology, the word, means the study of God. And love, well, love is that word that we all know too often, and it maybe is a word that means so many different things to us. And so our goal for this series is to connect, to connect how understanding who God is has anything to do with understanding love. Jesus was... Too much fun being half by them. This is why we need to get them upstairs. (laughs) We're trying to understand why Jesus, when he was asked what the best thing you could do with your life is, why he said the best two things you could ever put yourselves to would be loving God and loving people. And so through this series, the first two weeks, we looked at the why. Why we would love God and why we would ever want to love people. And now we're getting uber practical on the back end today and next week, talking about how. How do we love God and how do we love people? I think the big question today is when we talk about loving God is when we ask that question, how, why is it that something that could sound like so simple a question becomes so very quickly confusing and complex? I think if you asked 100 people who say they love God, how do you love God, you'd get at least 50 different answers. Because when we talk about loving God, it's very easy for us to take that question and we can either lose it and a lot of high spiritual sounding jargon that kind of leaves us in the dust, we can also take it to the point where we're looking at the minutiae of doctrine and so far that leaves us in the dark and just confused. It's easy for this question to get bound up and swamped down so we can't actually answer it. And when we say, how do you love God? All we're able to say is, well, you just kind of do. Or maybe it's even a question we don't know how to answer. And when we have those questions we don't know how to answer, it means we don't have to answer it. It almost lets you off the hook and it's a bit of a cop out, like how do you love God? Well, you just kind of do and it never asks anything of us. The challenge that you're going to have today for the rest of our conversation is going to be the challenge that is given of the simplicity of the answer to this question of how to love God. Because with a simple answer means you get the opportunity to give the simple response or not. 
And it's so simple, a five-year-old, a screaming five-year-old could understand what it means to love God. Jesus, when he clarifies what that genuinely means, if you wanted to boil it down to just seven words, he tells people, he says, this is how. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. That's it. Jesus sent to the world to enlighten all of mankind of what it means to truly love God and the most spiritually and theologically rich statement he can make is seven words long. If you love me, obey my commandments. And in that, he doesn't just mean, you know, like the big 10 commandments. What he's got going on there is what I've said to you about who God is and who you are and who other people are in the eyes of God. That, do that. The Greek word that is used, the Greek word that comes out as obey is the word tero, which means to pick up what someone else has put down, to take it for yourself, like you own it. And so we would obey the things Jesus said, like they're our actual commandments. The problem that we have with this is Jesus doesn't make it complex, and he doesn't even just write out a big long list of things. He says obey. He doesn't say loving God is spending time with him. He doesn't say loving God is saying nice things in prayer or songs of worship. He doesn't say loving God is reading your Bible. He doesn't say loving God is serving at your church or giving to your church. What he says is loving God is obedience. That you want your life to serve whatever he wants of it. And this is why I think that God spent the better half of, or the better part of 5,000 years communicating and writing down why and what obedience to him looks like. Why everything to do with his people has always been, let me tell you how to do it and what to do and then do it. I think it's why Jesus was sent to earth. So he could come and literally stand in front of people and realign and re-educate and highlight what love actually is. That it's not some man-made ritual and tradition, but it is this real, genuine, obedient relationship. And for those of us who ever put our faith in Jesus, we get given this thing called the Holy Spirit, this thing that resides within us, that then gives us the ability, the desire, and the craving to obey God more and more. So what God was doing, what Jesus did, and now what the Holy Spirit does, it is all so that we can become obedient to God. It is all so that we can show him love. Now, you're very smart people, and so you are already aware of the very real problem we're going to have talking about obedience. We don't like obedience. (laughs) I don't know how more simple to put it. We don't. By nature, humanly, we don't like to be obedient. Your boss tells you you need to work Saturday morning. You don't like that. The government puts some law into play that you don't like. It tells you how to live. You don't like that. Kids don't like being told by their parents that candy isn't actually its own food group. It's crazy. Once we're told to obey something, something naturally gets our backs up and wants to rebel against it. That is no different from kids and people to people who call themselves Christians. Those of us who say we love God, we still don't like obedience. We still more naturally would like a relationship where God sits right back there where we can turn around and ask him for stuff when we want to, but otherwise, I'm leading, I'm going ahead, and when I want you, I'll let you know. But what Jesus seems to be saying is that relationship would actually have God in the front, us asking, what do you want me to do? So how do we take this, this idea, and if you've come to Epiphany Station this morning, there's a good chance that you want to know how to love God and love people. How do we take the idea of loving God, something we like the idea of, and connect it to something we have a natural distrust of? Something that is naturally not tasting good in our mouths. Obedience. I don't know if you have any of the experiences in which there are moments in your life where things seem to just become crystallized. And it's like, ah, yeah, that makes perfect sense now. But I had one of these recently. A couple of months ago, and I don't know if you ever have these in, in the work that you do or anything like that, but sometimes you have to work from home. Sometimes you have to take a, an important phone call. Like, the work that I do as a pastor, sometimes like, I, there's an important question that needs to be answered from someone on the leadership team, or sometimes I receive a call from someone who's in the very moment of losing a loved one. And so sometimes I just have to tell my family, like, I need to take this call. I'm going to step upstairs and take it. Now, my wife gets that and understands that. I have three beautiful kids that don't quite get it. And when I say that, I'm going to go on the phone. What they heard is, it's time to make noise! 
And that's usually how it goes. I don't know if you saw this video two or three months ago. There's a guy who was doing an interview for um, BBC Worldwide, and he thought having this great in-depth conversation about social and political matters was a good thing to try and do from his home office. Go ahead and roll the video, Hal. Scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracy define those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider dinner, region? Dinner. I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift this. <laughs> Oh, look at the little baby coming in. But wait for it, here comes my favorite bit. There she is. There's mom. She's <laughs> dragging him out. Yeah. And just to finish, there we go. Now, <clears throat> luckily, when I take a phone call, I am neither important enough or famous enough to be called by BBC Worldwide to do a live interview. And, but that, there's that feeling of trying to do something important to the tune of three kids screaming a glass cheese stick or, or an argument about, you know, was that a bird on a branch or dirt on the rock? Really important, crucial things kids need to tell you about. The reason I tell you this is, is one moment in which I got this call, and I knew this call was eventually going to come because of something that was going on in this person's life. And, and I, the call came in, I said, Jackie was outside, and I said to the kids, okay, I said to my eldest boy, eight years old, I'm going to go upstairs and take this phone call. It's really important. I need you to stay down here, and I need you to keep your sisters, six years old and four years old. They've got names, but ages are quicker. And I need you to keep them down here. And he said, okay, Dad, I can do that. So I head upstairs, take the phone call. It's super serious. 17 seconds has gone by, and I hear the door knob start to twist. All right, all right, here we go. Thankfully, I'm a perfect parent, and I'll hold my cool, and the person on the other side of the phone won't realize I'm doing this. But as the door knob started to twist, I heard, girls, no. We can't go up there. Dad said no. We have to, girls, girls, no. We have to stay down here. Now, if you are not currently, right now, the parent of small children, this might seem like just a little thing. That's not important. If you are a parent of small children, that was huge because he listened and he did what I asked him to do. And not only did he do that, he then led his sisters to do what I'd asked them all to do. And in that moment, when I had asked him for obedience and he did it, I felt loved, I felt respected, and I felt like when I go downstairs, that boy's getting some ice cream because... <laughs> That stuff needs to be rewarded. <laughs> Here's the thing. When we're asked for obedience, we don't like it. When we ask it of other people and they do it, it makes us feel loved. It does. Obedience is actually a love language. When we ask it of others and we need it of others and they display it, it shows to us that they love and care about us. And obedience is not just a love language. What Jesus is trying to communicate here about loving God is obedience is God's love language. It is. Whether we like that or not, it is what he has tried to make as clear as possible. If you want to know how to love God, how to love God is obedience. He takes this point and he explains it a little bit further in a few verses on in his conversation in John 14. In verse 23, he replies to the people, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. This is the really hard line that Jesus takes. If you want to love God, you will obey God. But not only that, if you don't obey God, you are not loving God. What he's saying is this is an ongoing relationship you get to have with him. It's not a one and done, I said the prayer, salvation's mine and we're all set and square. Instead, what he's calling for is a lifestyle, which we would choose to express love to God regularly through our obedience. And do we always succeed? Definitely not. But the heart of it is do I want to obey God or do I not? Take it in this kind of context. Marriage, relationships that come together, sometimes come together in fire and sparks and passion, and it's great and it's delightful, but that's not what makes a loving marriage. It's not what makes it work or keeps it together. 
What makes it work is constant expressions of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. It doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're making tough decisions or making love, if you're having an argument or you're playing a game, or if you're on your way to your in-laws who are a little bit unhinged. It doesn't matter what's going on. You get the chance to express love to each other regularly, to love them or to not love them, no matter what's going on that day. And if that doesn't happen, there'll come a point in which you'll turn around and see that the relationship has gone stale. What once was all fire and sparks is now cold and lifeless, and and communication seems difficult, and trust seems difficult, and love seems difficult. It is not too different in relationships with each other as it is with us and God. And I don't know if you've ever started that relationship with God, maybe when you were a kid, maybe six months ago, but it can start with so much fire and passion and raw emotion. It can start with so much forgiveness and grace and mercy and so much love, and then all of a sudden, you turn and you look at the relationship, what's left, and it seems cold, and it seems flat, and it seems stale, and communication seems tough, and trust seems difficult, and love seems hard to do. This happens when we are not consistently reaffirming, confirming, consummating the relationship we want to have with our God. And we do that through obedience. We do that by showing to him the love that he has earned. And yeah, you know what? Obedience does mean obeying the Ten Commandments. It does. It means don't murder people, don't cheat, and don't steal. It also means many other things that Jesus had to say, and so do his believers. Like, you know what? If she's not your spouse, you should treat her with all the purity of a sister or a mother. If he's not your husband, then you know what he is? He's like a brother or a father to you. That's tough stuff to hear. It's tough stuff to obey. But obedience to God is trusting that he knows best for your life and doing what he says. Obedience to God means looking at everything that you have, everything that you've been given, from good to bad experiences, to all of the wealth that you have or don't have, to all the time and the resources, and seeing that you were built for ministry. You were built for service. You were built for good works. And you can obediently use those things to invest into the kingdom of God and show him love. And you know what? Obedience to God does mean seeing the sin in your life and killing it and instead bringing life into your life. It does mean on the daily saying in your vows to God, one again, I do. I do want you to be my God. I don't want this. I do want you. I want you to be my king. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be the greatest love of my life. And obedience to God in that way, let's not get this twisted, is really difficult. Because what it's asking of you and from you is everything everything that you have to offer, everything that you could ever control, everything that you could ever choose, you would instead in obedience say, God, what do you want me to do? And because all of this asks so much, how we love God needs to stay connected to the why. From conversation one in this teaching series, the why we love God. We love him because he loved us first. He loved him because he loved us at our worst and he sacrificed and he served and he gave us a way back. And so not to earn that, not to prove that, but in response to that, we obey. We obey and we sacrifice our lives to show love to him because sacrifice is the highest pinnacle expression of love. So we obey. We obey when it makes sense and we obey when it doesn't. We obey when we fully understand why we should and when we don't. And we obey even when it means giving up my rights and my free will. That's how to love God. That's what Jesus said when he said, look, if you're going to love me, obey my commandments. And so let's get incredibly practical. Like, let's make the shift from conversation to the point of application. What would it mean if you were going to love God with your life? Not a little bit, but all of your life. What would be the thing? Because I know there's a thing, and you know there's a thing. Your neighbors know there's a thing. Your loved ones know there's a thing. Your cat even knows there's a thing, and cats don't know anything. But you know there's a thing that if you were going to love God, this area of your life would need obedience. Because right now it's not. Right now it's absent. Something feels disjointed. Something feels wrong and broken. Here's what I'm going to have you do. 
and it might be potentially awkward. It's up to you how you feel about it. We're going to sit for a moment in a bit of quiet. And I'm going to ask you to take some time to think. You want to take some time to pray? Go ahead. You want to take some time to write some stuff down? You want to take some time to get that list out of your back pocket of how your spouse could be a better person and hand it over? Whatever you want to do. But we're going to take this time because I think if we took the time, we would actually know what it means to love God. How we could love him through obediently obeying that one thing that maybe has been sitting in the back of our mind for days, weeks, months, or years that we've been trying to squish down. Or maybe it's something fresh now that he's trying to communicate to you. Something quiet, something small, but something specific. If you love me, obey me. We're going to take a minute to do that. And if you're still looking at me, I know you're not doing it. And that's disobedient. And you shouldn't do that. <laughs> so take, <laughs> take a minute. Take a minute and think, pray, talk, write. This is the big question, and it's, it's a question for those of us who say we want to love God. It's, it's not for anyone else. It's for us who say we do. What do you need to obey? What's the thing that came up? What's the thing that you heard? What's the thing that you wrote down? Is it one thing, two things, five paragraphs? doesn't really matter. Because whatever you have now that you know if you were to obey God, you would have to do this, you now get to decide, do I love God or do I not? Will I love him or will I not? Because our love for God is not based on our beliefs. It's not based on our feelings or even our words. It is based on our actions and our obedience to him. That's the highest expression. It's the highest form of worship. It's the very theology of love that we would choose to love him the way that he's called us to love him. As we wrap up this conversation here, and appreciate that there might be something that has kind of come up in this conversation that's quite tender, quite sensitive, quite difficult, that maybe if you wanted to be obedient, you don't know how you would be obedient to it. And that's why, quite frankly, the church exists. It exists as a group of people to help one another take steps of transformation in the life of Jesus. And so if you have something that you know God's calling you to obedience on it, but you don't know what to do about it, I want to challenge you to ask us for help. And we will help you get connected with someone who can have that conversation with you. As you walked in this morning, you were handed a connection card that's attached to the program. It's perforated so you can tear it off. There we go. And what you can do with this is you can jot down one thing, five things, ten things. You can say that you want to know more about Jesus and maybe just know more about Epiphany. Maybe you want to talk about a specific area of obedience. Maybe it's about service and maybe it's like Paul and Linda were talking about. It's you, God wants you to do something with the gifts you've been given. Whatever it is, you can jot that down and you can drop it in a red box and some from our team will follow up and be in touch. Because we believe that we are here not to talk about loving God, but actually going about loving God. And that means helping one another take these steps of obedience and expressing that to him regularly. Let me pray for you guys. Father God, I thank you that we, we get to be here and, and talk about you and who you are. And we get to talk about your will and your desire of what you want for our lives and an expression of love from our lives that would see us be who we were born to be. And so God, we need your help. Because obedience doesn't come easy and we don't even want to do it. And so we need you to work within us and out through us to make us want to submit and obey the things you've called us to. Maybe it's relationship, maybe it's resources, maybe it's just our beliefs and the things we choose to do about them. God, we want to be obedient because we want to love you. So God, I ask you to protect us against complacency. Don't let us leave here today and just kill this conversation. Help us instead to keep it alive as we walk home, drive home, as we go for lunch, as we, as we go to bed. We would just think and talk and pray about how to love you. God, we ask you to lead us in the way that you desire to lead us and help us to respond. In Jesus' name, amen.